Well, good morning, church. Good morning, and welcome to the, our, our one service here at the First United Methodist Church of Wyandotte on the corner of Oak and Biddle. We'd like to welcome you all here, as well as a uh, special hello to any visitors who have joined us in the uh, sanctuary this morning, or anybody watching online as well, or perhaps you're catching us later in the week as you view our streaming. Again, thank you. Um, we would like to remind those of you that are present to please uh, fill out the proper portion of the ritual of friendships that are located in the pew uh, beside you. All right. Um, we know that uh, we've got a bright sunny day. Thank you for coming and however and wherever God has led you from, we thank you for coming to us and whenever time you spend with us, you always fill it home here at the First Church. Now before we begin with our praise and worship, we have a few announcements and our first is about the April mission. Julie, if you would. Good morning. I am here to talk about the mission of the month for April, and it's Redbird Mission. Redbird Mission and Redbird Clinic have been providing ministries in the Appalachian Mountains since 1921. That's over 100 years. The mission is located in Beverly, Kentucky, in one of the poorest counties in the U.S., People of the area face chronic poverty, lack of jobs, poor housing, and rugged mountain terrain. The services offered by the Redburn Mission are a Christian school, K through 12, early childhood development, clothing and craft store, family ministries, senior citizen center, elderly housing, adult education, meals on wheels, and a medical and dental clinic. These services of Redbird are only possible because of the support of local churches across the United States. Because of ongoing commitment from churches, Redbird is making great strides towards realizing their vision of building healthy, economically sustainable communities in the mountains of the southeastern Kentucky. The Redbird School has been providing an excellent education for 36 years to children to, from kindergarten through 12th grade. They study scripture in a program called Seek and Discover Treasure in God's Word. Praise Dance team members share their faith when they perform at basketball games and chapel services. Younger children put on puppet shows and learn sign language. There are opportunities to perform in theater productions and elaborate Christian programs. Honor students are recognized and their choir program is well known for excellence and have traveled to Indiana and Illinois. You can help support this vital Methodist ministry with second mile giving. Please use your mission fund envelope any time during the month of April. Your gifts and prayers for Redbird and the people they serve give life and hope. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. <clears throat> Next, Hands with Detroit Mission is scheduled for April 27th. This day has a history of gathering people from all over our district to be in mission work. While time has allow the momentum be behind this day to flow and ebb, and we've somehow managed to survive a global pandemic as well with your uh, generosity. The Greater Detroit District, which First Wyandotte is part of, are energized and more enthused than ever to pour love and carry joy and grace and goodness back into the city of Detroit and its underserved populations alongside one another. Wyandotte First will also like to participate in an off-site capacity as well by collecting new twin, beach, twin bed sheet sets and new bath towel sets. Okay, I, I wanted to make sure I said new and I kind of messed that up, so I'll repeat that. Okay, Wyandotte First would like to participate in an off-site capacity by collecting new twin bed sheets and new bath towel sets. Again, welcome to uh, First Church. I always uh, hope you feel at home and perhaps after the service stop by for some coffee and donuts in the fellowship hall. Now let's continue to praise.
Well, we invite you to stand and join your voices with ours as we sing our praises. Chaos 
the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Before the prayer of intercession, I have a few uh, prayer sharings. Uh, Beverly Zawicki was in the hospital toward the middle of the week with some uh, uh, heart problems. They suspect possible blood clots. She is home now and uh, welcome for prayers. She's on blood thinner medication as they figure out toward through this time what next to do. So we'll be raising her up in the prayer. Also this past week Roger Gibson, I think many of you got to notice, died. The funeral will be this Saturday Visitation here in the sanctuary starting around 11, funeral at noon, and a luncheon following afterwards at 1 p.m. And Pam would like to know if there's some people that could donate toward the luncheon, let her know, because she's pulling that together. So, uh, and uh, also lift up. Steve and Ava, who are in Germany. That's why you're stuck with me preaching. And they should be coming back on Friday because he's hoping to, with me, be taking care of the funerals. But you know how they are these days. So we pray for safe travel for them. Okay, okay let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we do heart disease and your of tears through the loss through death of one of our family and friends. Reach out to these and we may be a times of sorrow in times of want that we may be assured of your presence, even at those times when we face the shadow of not knowing where you are. So be patient with us. Hold us 
as well as these two families in your hands. Hold us in the strength of your faith through us into the faith that Christ walks with us and within us through this all. We also pray for your presence with our country's leaders around this world. You know all too well our bent as human beings to not trust, to not like, to try categorize, categorize those that are different from us, seeming to see the differences that we human beings like to pull us apart and not the similarities that we are all one in your name, brothers and sisters, parents and children, together of the one human race that is your family on this earth. Help us to learn that we are one. Be with our leaders to lead them into some kind of understanding that we all belong to you, the one God of all of us, the Father of the Son, who is our Christ, that resides in each one of us as your Holy Spirit. In these names of God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray to you and say, Amen.
At this time, if the usher could come forward for the collection of our tithes and our offerings. I should have come forward for the blessing of our Please stand for our doxology. Good morning. I haven't been up here to look at you since last summer. And people have asked, are you nervous? And my, when uh, yesterday afternoon I was working on the sermon, and Julie, my wife, said, why are you nervous? You've been doing this for 50 years. But I remember my father saying, if you're preaching and you're not nervous, 
you haven't the faintest idea what you're doing. Because this is not Philip Seymour words. These are the words of God spoken through his servant, Philip Seymour. And today's servant, if I can find her, really was one suggested by the adult Bible class that uh, five of you have been attending rather regularly the hour before worship. It's a, we meet in the lounge, so there's plenty of space for all of you to come one hour earlier. And I have to admit, I'm not the only one that is teaching in that class. It is a graduate class, if you want to put it that way, right now in the Gospel of Mark. And every time we get together, all five of us, six of us counting me, learn something new. So I'm not sure when we'll be getting back. I guess we'll have one next week and then when uh, the crew is back from Germany, my wife and I go to Scotland. So you won't see me for a couple weeks. But this sermon grew out of our study of Mark and the discussion about good and evil. And what is God? And what is prayer? Let me read the scripture that got us in that class to this point, Mark 7. Oh, it's up there, good. Mark 7. Mine may be a slightly different one than that, but in between, if there's differences, there's new meanings. Beginning with verse 20. He said, yep. what comes out of a man is what defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, come all evil thoughts. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile man. The scribes accused Jesus in this section of Mark, chapters 6, 7, and 8, of doing unclean things. I'm going to be coming back to unclean several times. That's the Hebrew word that translates into most of the European languages as really sin. I personally like unclean over sin because unclean seems closer to what I think Jesus is talking about. The Old Testament was a time of laws for the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. But from the Ten Commandments in Exodus, they built through all the rest of the Old Testament traditions for proper rituals, proper attire to go to temple, to go to synagogue and family worship. Also many and numerous dietary laws. The scribes and the Pharisees are accusing Jesus and his disciples of being unclean because they're not following all those laws, even down to the dietary laws. Even though part of being unclean that prevents you from going to synagogue is if you spent time the previous day with someone who was unclean. So what is unclean? 
And that's what I want to talk about this part of the sermon before I get into how do we stop being unclean. Theologians have looked at the duality of good and evil. Two realities that the theologians say are clearly present in the world. Now, I'm not arguing that. But what they come down to is a common belief in dualism. There is a God, Adam O, who is good. And then there's a devil or Satan who is bad. I don't believe that. I don't believe in the devil. I don't believe in evil having that much power. I am a theist. I believe in God, the one and only ultimate power in the universe, let alone in this world. So what is bad? We theologians have also come up with original sin. Where do you hide now? Can you give it to me up here? Okay. I don't see it up here. I guess I have to stay here. I was going to wander around against telling them I wasn't going to wander around up there. <laughs> so I guess I'm stuck here. Anyway, that's all right. I believe there is one God, but that one God does not guarantee us goodness, no suffering, no pain. The God just promises us to be present in all of that. Our belief in God does not mean I go to church so nothing bad is going to happen to me. I'm a human being, so I'm never going to have cancer or diabetes or have injuries or be subject to hatred, to discrimination, subject to the problems of war, disease. That's not my God. That's not the Father of Christ. God does not promise us easy living. <coughs> so where does all this evil, bad things, my cancer that has been with every male in I don't know how many generations back of the Seymour family. I had never met my great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather, but I know my grandfather died of cancer. My father died of cancer, prostate cancer. I'm guessing there's some of the men here today that have had prostate cancer. But God gave us a brain to work out how to reduce human suffering. And cancer is one of those things that we've learned how to not die from. I'll be 79 this June. With that comes a, whole, a lot of other things that happens to my brain. Those of you that are in your 70s, you realize why can't I remember this? Why can't I get that word out? I see a lot of smiles out there. <laughs> but God gave us a brain to learn how to not do, suffer some of those bad things. So my next oldest brother, 
is now 83. My oldest brother is now 87. And we're all chugging along with our forgetfulness, <laughs> with our, I can't do some of that stuff I used to do. And Julie says, well, you're 70, what do you want? Where does all this bad things come from? Other theologians have probably tried to mark it up to original sin. Hogwash on original sin. A baby born. And I was lucky enough to be there when Molly was born. A baby born is not born in sin. A baby born is born in innocence, ready to learn about life. And if given a good family, a good community, will learn what goodness is. But a baby born, like all of us were, is born in a human, fallible body that does not say perfect. Even into the teen years, let alone into the 70s. And some of you think my 79 makes me a child. Yeah, I see some of you nodding out there already, knowing, oh, what does he know? <laughs> So where does this bad stuff come from? The bad stuff comes from being a human body in a physical world where what we think of as bad things happen. I'm not doubting disease. I'm not arguing that there's no sickness. I'm not arguing that there's no war and hatred. Oh, how we know that? Just turn on the six o'clock news. But all these things that Jesus calls unclean are not from out there. They're from inside some human body somewhere. So that's why Math Mark is saying unclean does not come from out there. Unclean comes from inside us. Because our bodies, if you really want to get into what is a human being, a human being is just an animal that can think and begin to presume they're the top of the food chain. But as Christians, what did God the Father do? God the Father became human, Jesus, became the Son, so that God the Father would want us to know that God understands what it is to be human because God the Father is also God the Son, and Christ was the Messiah who came from the human known as Jesus. Think of what Jesus went through. Christ is perfect. And as we discussed in Bible class, sorry you haven't been there, because you get a lot of discussions we could go on. Jesus became the Christ. But Jesus is the human presence. How many of you have had teenagers that you try to grow, grow up to be good, right? Oh, don't hold her hand up. What did the teenage Jesus do? when they visited Jerusalem. As a family, along with all the extended family, 
because Mary's family went, went, Joseph's family went, neighbors' families went. All the families traveled, and they tended to travel with families because that's a time when aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters could get together with parents. And so Mary and Joseph weren't really traveling together to Jerusalem. They're traveling with family, celebrating family. And so when they left Jerusalem, they left as separate families. And it took a couple days before they discovered Jesus isn't here. Where was the teenage Jesus? At the temple, not telling mom and dad I'm staying. How many of you nice parents would love to take your teenager, like we did, <coughs> Julie and I, to Washington, D.C.? And then we leave separately, get up along the way, and our child isn't with us. How many of you parents would be happy? <laughs> ah, I'm not tempting you to say yes. They went back, concerned. What happened to our son? And they found him eventually in the temple. Now I ask you, was Jesus, the teenager, doing something unclean, causing mom and dad worry? That's a human trait. We'll call it a sin but unclean. Jesus, as an adult, starts to become the Christ, the Messiah. And so he's the Messiah. He believes he's the Messiah to the Jewish Israelite nation. And Mark records, he's going into a house and this Syrophoenician woman, non-Jew, non-Israelite, a Greek, a non-believer, comes to him and says, can you heal my child? And what does the human Jesus say? I can't heal you. You're not an Israelite. And a derogatory Jewish name for a Gentile is a dog. The woman knows that. So the woman says to Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, even dogs can eat the crumbs left from the table. And the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, realizes He's not just a Jewish Messiah. He's a savior of the world. And so his calling isn't just to save the Israelites, but to save the world for God. Now, that's a human thing to say, no, I'm mighty and you're not. But he grows into being the Christ. Same thing in the temptation. Same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane. How many of us have tried to bargain with God? I'm not asking for hands. I'll put mine up because I'm guilty. God, can you do this for me? God, can you do this for me? God, can you help? my son, my daughter, to get a better feeling on what it is that he's supposed to do or she's supposed to do? That's what he's doing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hey, Dad, can't we work this out a little bit different? Hmm? I know what you have in light for me. I know what's going to be happening. Can't we work something else out? Again, I won't ask for a Hey, how many of us have talked to God like that? Can't we work this out, something? But the human 
Jesus becoming the divine Christ says, not my will, but yours. He's growing. And then on the cross, the human Jesus is suffering in pain. And among the words, there's the one that how many of us had often said, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? I'm having to deal with the death of a family member. I'm having to deal with cancer. I'm having to deal with someone not really being good like they should be. Why have you forsaken me? Why can't you do something? But not my will, but thy, thy will be done. God knows what it is to be human. Because Jesus has gone through all the things we've gone through. Doing unclean things. Not letting family members know things. So they worry. Having to face disease. Having to face loneliness. Having to face hatred. God does not promise goodness. God promises to be with us. <coughs> that is his promise. Not to protect us from all the world. Though that'd be nice, wouldn't it? But that's not God. God will be with us no matter what happens. In the midst of cancer, God will be with us. In the midst of facing death, God will be with us. In the midst of whatever disease is happening, God will be with us. That is the promise of God. That is the one reality that exists in our faith. We are never alone, even when we feel it. God is the devil is not. That's part one. So, how do we focus on God's presence? Part two. The words of John Wesley. God does nothing but an answer to prayer. and everything with it. I didn't put up there the rest of it, which is also important. Prayer, therefore, is not an option for mankind, but a necessity. Prayer is when we're opening up ourselves to God's presence, to Christ's presence. So, how do we pray? Well, what is prayer? It's a conversation with God. But what's a conversation? Conversation is a two-way event. Have a conversation with your spouse, and what happens? I talk, she talks, she talks, I talk. With a neighbor, over the phone, you talk back and forth. It's a two-way. Question I'm going to end with in a minute, maybe more than a minute, in a minute, is do you listen to God? Or is your prayer the community prayers that we have here? Grace Before Meals, unison prayer here in the sanctuary, the prayer that Reverend Steve or I make as a worship leader, 
intercession, thanksgiving prayers, reading prayers from prayer book, reading prayers from the upper room. How many of you had a mother that taught you to kneel by the bed when you're growing up to say prayer before you go to sleep? Those are good prayers. But those are not conversations. The question is, when do you listen to when God has something to say to you? And how do you do that? That's the tough one. It is necessary because we need to be open to what God is saying to us. How many have had someone say, after a heart attack, I think God's trying to tell me something. That's one way God can get through to us, but that's very drastic if you're waiting for that to happen. How do we listen? How are we open to God saying something to us? This gets us to part three. First Thessalonians 5:17. It's a really short one. Most English versions have pray constantly. I love the King James Version. Pray without ceasing. Now, a lot of Christians go around in many faiths Thing. Praying without ceasing means you become a nun or a monk. You go around always thinking prayers to God, thanking God that pray without ceasing isn't going around like this. Hi, how are you, Dave? I'm thinking about God. Now, that's not praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing doesn't happen easily, doesn't happen when you're growing up. Didn't happen to me until I hit 40. I knew how to pray. By the time I hit 40 in 1985, I'd already served three or four different churches, teaching them about God, teaching them about Christ. I don't look at my sermons anymore from that time. But in the summer of 1985, when I turned 40, I went on a 30-day prayer retreat kept in silence. That's when I first encountered Jesus. I only have two minutes to wrap this up. Jesus, Julie warned me, you're gonna to go too long. During that prayer retreat, kept in silence, I ended up having five assignments of one hour each day, and I needed a journal after each one by a spiritual director. The first week, I learned how to talk with Jesus. Second week, I learned how to argue with Jesus. The third week, Jesus got fed up with that. And when I started arguing with him, Philip, shut up and listen. He came, he still has to tell me that. The fourth week, I learned how to really hear him speak, not with heart attack. One of the times that last week, I, 
I was really, Jesus was there. I just put my head on his shoulder and asked him to he hold me. He held me. He had me. I opened my eyes, and I see Jesus walking away. I said, what? And Jesus said to me, Phil, there's enough of me for everyone to have one. The little Jesus. The little Jesus goes a long way. Now, how do you do that? That's four more sermons, which I don't know what I'm going to get around to, but there's different ways of praying. At our home, Julie has several signs. One says, wherever you go, go with all your heart. Your heart is the seat of where God and Christ lives, your heart. Go with your heart. She had another one that was hung over our bed. Give to God and go to sleep. That's another way. Like your mother caught me. I go to sleep. Help me sleep, God, that I may be closer to you in the morning. Those are ways of setting yourself up to listen to God. It doesn't usually happen in the early couple of decades. Because we're hung up on God is good. God is not good. God is present. God joys when you have good. God is comforting when you have bad. God is present. Christ is present. That when you can walk with Christ, that you're moving on toward praying without ceasing. And that didn't allow me to do that till I was over 40. After that experience, a good friend of mine said, you know, Phil, you're talking an awful lot less and saying a lot more. That's why I don't preach those old, old sermons anymore. Okay, final hymn. Oh, for a thousand sing, tongues to sing, number 57. In the hymnal, please stand.
in the peace of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>